So good morning. Um, I hope none of you two are feeling too rough after last night's party. Um, so to wake you all up a bit, we're going to do a quick survey. So if you're a developer, put your hands up. Yay, loads of developers. Um, uh, designers? Designers are cool too. Um, <laughs> pro product managers? Mm. <laughs> no, they're cool too. Uh, and, and anyone else? UX? OK. <laughs> so, well, so uh, a bit about me. So I'm a technical architect at Beamly. So basically, this means I'm responsible for architecting how we build our site responsibly. I specifically, I'm looking at techniques that we use to adapt our site, depending on the device used to access our site. I've written a book about respons responsive design called Beginning Responsive Design. And I regularly contribute to a lot of open source projects. I particularly focus on projects that are related to responsive design, so Simple State Manager, Echo.js, Critical.js, et cetera. So um, current desi uh, responsive design techniques focus on mobile first. They focus on how things fit on a small device, and then we progressively enhance for large displays, providing fuller experiences. There has not been the same focus, however, on the, either content or the performance of our site. So what, what I'm going to do today is look at how we can rethink the way we design and build our site to give these areas at the focus that they deserve. So first up, we're going to look at our site content. And this is looking how it displays to our users and how we can adapt it based on the type of device the user is using. So this, this guy, Bobby Anderson, says it much better than me. So to so quote him, content is king. It always will be, has been, and always will be. Co content is why users visit your site, subscribe to your newsletters, and follow you on social media. Content is the single most important aspect of your website. So what Bobby's quote is telling us is when starting a project, we should be prioritizing time to prepare and optimize our content. So to do this, we need, we need to have a, f a good understanding of what our content will be before, before we even start our design. So this can be one of the hardest, hardest things in your response to design because you've got to get your clients on board to provide that content to begin with. But in, in, in doing so, it means you, you, you can pro properly plan your response to site around it. You, the, the, your, your content is really, really, really important. Content must work on a wide, and your content must work on a vi wide variety of devices. And you need to be able to res work responsibly. If we take a look at, at the uh, global averages for device usage, we're looking at 65% are still on desktop, but we're moving to 29% on mobile and 6% on tablet. Um, so at Beamly, we, we're actually looking at 91% on mobile. So it's, it, 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 it completely varies on, on, on your site. So it's definitely worth looking at your own site usage statistics when, when considering uh, who, who's actually using your site. So, so when it comes to our content, we want, we want, we want, we want, we want to, to prioritize it in a way that is meaningful to our users. So the first thing we're going to do is look at how we can prioritize content based on the type of device. So before you start thinking about the order, or, order of your content, you, so order of your content, you need to audit it. You, you, need, you, need, to, you need to work out what, 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 what content will matter, matter most to your users out of the content that you intend to put on your site. And then you, you, you then need to think about that in terms of different devices. So you need to think about how, how someone visiting your site on mobile might think about the content on your site, and so or someone visits it on desktop. Content does not have to be the same order on every device. Typ typical responsive techniques see content prioritization as being considered as an overall piece, rather than being the context of individual device types. In reality, users are trying to achieve what users are trying to achieve when on your site can differ, likely, li likely di differ based on the type of device a user is using. So let's have a look at that in practice within, within the example of a restaurant. So we don't want to provide a cut down site on mobile. We want to find a full feature site with shifted content priorities. So in, in, the, in the example of a small device, when we, if, I, if I'm wanting to get to a restaurant, I might want to get the phone number so I can call up and, and, and make, make a reservation. I might want to get directions to, to actually get to the restaurant. But then when I'm, not, when I'm sat in the office, in the office on, my, on my laptop, my, my priority is going to be completely different. What I'm actually going to be looking at is things like the atmosphere. So what, what, what's this place about? What, what's making me want to go there? What's the menu like? So my son is um, gluten intolerant, so I have to consider, is there going to be something there that he can eat? Um, so I apologize for my design skills. I'm a developer. Um, so it, but in practice, it, it would uh, look a bit like this. So I, I, I lead with the phone number in the header. So I, I straight away, the user can click that and make a phone call. I then, I then have um, information on how to get there followed by how to book a table. You'll then see that me me menus and um, the atmosphere are lowering the priority, but it's still there. It's still important content that we shouldn't block from our users. So if we're looking at how we can transform that onto, onto larger devices, 
we, 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 can ha we, can, we can lead with the atmosphere, with big, bold imagery, t tell, telling, t t telling our users about the story of our restaurants. Then we can have good, clear call to actions, both menu, menus, booking, and then directions. So, to, so if we want to uh, reorder content, we can start using a, 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 the um, CSX Flexbox uh, layout module, level one specification, which, which allows us to handle the ordering of our content. And then we can use media queries to, to target this based on, based on, the, sc on the screen size. If, and we'll look at a simple code example. So because we, we're typically building mobile first, we lead, we, we lead with our, our content ordered for mobile. So we've got better content for mobile and better content for desktop. <coughs> then in our CSS, we use a media query to uh, spe specify the, um, that we're targeting devices over 600, 768 pixels. We tell that our wrapper that it's, the contents will be display flex and the, the, the direction of our content is gonna be stacked. So we want, we want it to be flex direction column. Then we just specify an order value on, bo on, on both the uh, better content for desktop class and the better content for mobile class to specify the order. The limitation here is that not all older browsers support Flexbox. It's, there, 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 there isn't a, a reliable polyfill. And um, so, so if, if, if you're starting to support browsers like Internet Explorer 9 or below, it, and you want to prioritize content, my advice to you is, while the rest of your site can be built mobile first, your prioritization can be built desktop first. So you're pr you are progressively enhancing still, for the, the, but your weakest device is Internet Explorer, not the, the mobile device. Our mobile devices now are really powerful. We shouldn't always be considering that in every way that they're weakest. If, if in doubt about what your users' priorities are, invite them in and ask them. While it's very easy to make assumptions about how our users use your site, um, the, the simplest way to actually be sure is to is, is, is invite a number of them in to ask them. You don't have to build the interface to test it. With, with your, all you need to do is, is take them through your wireframes. As, aside from looking at how we can prioritize content, we should be looking at how we can ensure content is discoverable across a wide variety of devices. On larger devices, navigating a site is often really easy. We, it, we, if we take a look at the Sony site, for example, it has very clear navigation covering the key areas of business. So if you take a look at this screenshot, uh, you've got the other store, electronics, entertainment, and support. We then, on the right-hand side, have a search box where the, so the user can then start ser searching for any content that they cannot find. find. Unfortunately, on the majority of small site, sites, because of the way that we'll be building our sites, navigation on our site becomes a lot less obvious. If we, ta if we take a look at that Sony site again, you'll, you'll see that, that the navigation is completely obscured inside the burger menu. In, in addition, it's not, it's not already obvious where the search has disappeared to, which, which is actually inside the burger menu as well. So, so at Beanley, we had a very similar problem. We, 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 we found that all, we were burying, burying our navigation inside the hamburger menu, and users were just scrolling past it and never opening it. So. T t taking that Sony example again, um, if we, I've, mo I've moved the, the core navigation underneath that, the Sony logo. In doing that, I've been able to replace the hamburger logo with, with, with a search uh, button, so the user can quickly get to search, search the content of the site. Th this has made onwards journeys much more obvious, and, being, and, and, and the compromise, of course, is that content is pushed down sli slightly. How, how, however, this, this compromise is worth making, especially since devices' sc screens are, on average, getting bigger, because we, we, we are then able to provide our user a better user, user journey. An, an, another thing you'll notice when, when it comes to the co content sites is some, some sites are just hiding content from, from small, small devices, which, which has a number of disadvantages. The first is if, they dis if, they, if the user has visited your site on their desktop, and then they want that same content on their mobile later on, and it's hidden, they can't access it. Even worse, if someone's uh, done a quick Google search, and they, um, they're coming to, to your site from Google, and Google has indexed your page to say that content's on the page and it's not there, the user experience is really poor for, you to, for it to be completely missing. So we, we, so we don't want to make our content completely inaccessible on a small device. So an example of this will be the GL, GLH site, which made the decision to hide this lovely map from mobile users. It, it's, it, it's a beautiful map, and, and, and on mobile you'll see that, that all they show is, is the address, the telephone number, and the fact number. So what they could have done is there's some space there next to the address, so they could have put the map there, or they could, or they could have maybe had like a, a button that linked to another page to take you to a map on another page. They could have changed that journey. So in, 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 instead of simply removing content, we should be thinking about how we can change the functionality to better suit the device. Um, so a, a, a perfect example would be a, a list of, of FAQs on the site. So we, ha we, have, we have a list of FAQs, uh, but when on a small display, that would be really hard to, to find the question that's relevant to you. So instead, we can collapse that into an accordion. 
And by being in an accordion, you can just have, have the questions visible and the user can find the, the answers a lot quicker. Another example would be tab content on, on desktop. So what you see is um, tabs can have quite long titles, which, we, which when next to each other on, on small devices wouldn't fit. So instead, that can be turned into, in, into an accordion. So it's allowed the titles to be displayed fully. The age-old light box, which uh, designers still want to put on sites, um, it, it does provide a good experience in some, some use cases um, on, on a desktop site, perhaps a login form or, get, or viewing an image in a gallery. But on, 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 a, on a small device, it's, it's very difficult to make that usable because you, you, you could have the, the uh, use case where um, you, 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 you enlarge an image and it might not be obvious how to exit that image and not, not obvious that they're not going to a new page. So the solution is always, instead of having a light box on, on mobile, you, you provide a new page for them to go to and then make sure those on your journeys work very well for, for that new page. So if we, if we want to look at something a lot more complex, uh, with something like Parallax on desktop, it works really well at telling a story about a site. However, the, the, the problem comes that it's uh, on, mo on mobile devices, t the, 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 some devices won't support some of the technology used in Parallax, and, and then other, other devices will actually have such small displays that it, it, it damages the user experience. So instead, we can choose to make this, the, the site simply scrollable on, 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 on mobile and make the content really readable and make it really stand out. So ha having done some content optimizations, you might be asking yourself, uh, how, how can you measure the success of content optimization? The first way of which we, we could already briefly is ask your user to test your, your site and observe them. So in observing them, you can actually, you can actually see how, how they interact with your site and, whether, and, how, and, and how they're getting on with your optimizations. And then you can ask them about their experiences and, and, where, and, and what they would change about that. An alternative way, which allows you to get much bigger sample size, is to, is to A-B test your different functionality. So you could have two, uh, two versions of the same components on your site, but, but, and then, al al then alternate which is shown to different users. So basically, um, some users would get one version, and another version would get another version. Then you can measure how many people proceed on an onward journey, and how many abandon that journey. So in, in, in A-B testing, you actually are um, able to get, work out which is actually best for your user for, from onward journeys. So in summary of our content, content is king. And within approximately 35% of users not using a desktop browser, we, we, we need to ensure that content is optimized for all the different devices. Now, that was a lot of content, so now for time for a cat break. Um, so having looked at the content of sites, we'll now focus on performance. So, so it's all well and good optimizing the, the content to be opt opt optimal um, experience, but if, if we don't load that fast for our users, they'll, they'll, they'll leave our site before they even see it. So what's its performance? So I wanted to, to do a, uh, get a proper definition of, of, of um, performance for you guys, so I, do, I, I, I asked Google. And Google told me this. It's the action or process of performing a task or a function. So in relation to a website, performance is the measure of how long it takes to, to deliver the content to a user. So back to that definition, the task is loading our website. There are two type, key types of performance that are important to a website page load performance. So this is the, the time it takes to fully load, load a page, download all your assets, and, um, and to render. Perceived performance is a perception of the user from your site. So, th so this is, is the, the time it takes to um, start rendering your page and start getting to interact with it. So now we're going to have a look at a quick video of the Guardian site and, 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 how, and, how, how, and how they load their content. Um, I, 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 this video was, was, uh, was made using web page tests on a 3G device. So it, it shows what a, a real experience might be for a, a mobile user. So um, at four, four seconds, you'll see the content comes in. So the user can start interacting with that content, start reading the article. Then at seven seconds, you see the imagery arrives. So by, so, so, so they, by loading the image later, that, that means they've, they've, the user can start interacting. And then the user is continuing to interact, but in the background, stuff is still continuing to load. So we've had icons appear. Um, and then right at the end of 32 seconds, you'll see the advert finally comes in. So they've made the active decision to delay the loading of the advert to last, which actually means the, the um, perceived performance of the website is it loads really fast. So why should I care about performance of my site? A responsive, responsive site is expected to work on a wide variety of internet connections. A user can sat in an office or to work on, on a desktop device, on a, um, maybe on a gigabit connection, uh, or, or they could be out in the countryside loading your site on a 2G connection, and they still want to be able to visit your site. But one of the problems, one of the trends you, uh, that I've been seeing in the past few years is that pages are, re are, are increasing in weight. They're getting heavier. We, we, we're making them richer. We're using more CSS. We're using um, more imagery. To, we're using more JavaScript to make a better I interactive experiences. But this all has a cost. The average page weight has been increasing year on year. 
So in, in 2012, you're looking at 973 kilobytes would be your average page. But, but by March 2015, it's 2,008 kilobytes. So put that in perspective, that's an increase of 106%. If we start breaking that down by um, content type, what you'll see is that um, we've seen a drop in flash and, an increase in and, and, and the bigger increase in image, but the, generally, everything is increased at the same rate. So we've seen uh, increases across the board. Um, if we if start looking at the time it takes to start rendering your site, so this is where um, you can actually start seeing sort of render as the, the white screen has disappeared. Um, the time it, in, in, that it takes to start rendering the site has increased by 34%. So this affects the perceived performance of a page. This, the, 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 so this, this metric is what's going to be really important to us going forward. And, and th th this, is, this is affected by both what the decisions we make as designers and as, as, as developers, but it's also affected by things like network performance and device performance. So you need to be really working really hard to optimize the areas you can control because you, can, you cannot control those two factors. So you, your boss wants you um, to build this website really, really quickly. But um, you, you, you tell them, I want, to, I want to be able to spend some time on performance. So how, how can you justify that to, to your boss? Who's, where it's, where, because it's to a business, time is money. And several companies have tested whether performance affects them financially. So Amazon, Amazon did a test where they... De de delayed their, um, the, the loading of their page and found that with every 100 millisecond delay in loading a page, it cost them 1% of sales. So in put that in perspective, there are huge businesses that, that generate million, millions of dollars of sales e uh, every, every year. So 1% of that is a huge figure. And then Google did a similar test where they put an extra 500 milliseconds delay in front of, their ser of search results, and that just increased traffic by 20%. So, so to Google, that's 20% less ad revenues. So to, to your business and to your clients, performance does matter. So now we're going to take a look at some steps that, that we can take to improve our site performance. We're going to start with some simple stuff and then move up to sort of stuff sort of that's a bit more complicated. So the simplest thing we can do is optimize how we render our assets. This includes loading only, only images that are necessary. The first way that we can do this is start looking at the picture element. So it doesn't make sense to load a 1,000 pixel wide image for a device that's maximum screen size of 320 pixels. So this is where the picture element comes in. It allows us to specify different images for different viewport sizes. So I'm only going to cover it briefly. Uh, I think uh, the talk yesterday Phil gave, gave, gave a lot of information about it. So, but in, to put it briefly, the, the, source, the uh, picture element encloses several, several source elements and an image element. So what happens is the, the browser will, get, will, will go through each of these, um, these source elements until, until it finds a, a, a media attribute that matches. So this uses the same media expressions that we use in our media queries. So you can use sort of like min width, you could use um, orientation, uh, you could use min height. So you can, you can prop properly configure how, when these images are shown. So I'm going to show a quick video how this would work. So um, upon testing this example by resizing our browser, you'll see that as the browser increases in width, larger images are downloaded and loaded. Brow browsers that support the picture element will only download the image the browser needs. To use the picture elements on your site, you will need to include a, pol a polyfill, which is called picture fill. As only dr Android browser, Firefox, Chrome, and Opera support it, there's, no, th 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 there's not even any, look, any support in the technical preview of Internet Explorer. So uh, we, we don't know when that's going to arrive. Uh, another way in which we can f look at asset loading performance is start to, start to defer loading of both image and video content, which will need uh, to improve the initial page load. The most common content to defer is loading of images. So at Beam Beamly, we, we, we defer the loading of images until they're about to be scrolled into view. The benefit being that the page starts to render faster. And, and, on, and on a side note, that, that, that it also means that if a user never, ne is never going to see an image, they will never, they, 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 their, phone will, or their phone or their tablet or, or desktop will never download that image. Um, similarly, the Guardian use a very similar approach. So, uh, the, the, but, but with their approach, they actually have they guess what the first few images will be that, that are in, will be visible, and they 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 don't lazy load those, but they do defer the loading of the images further down the page. In cases where loading assets was deferred, it's very important to in, to ensure a suitable placeholder is in place. So, in the case of Beamly, we actually use a loading spin to say something's coming, right? But in the, in the case of, of Guardian, they actually ensure that the, the, the space that the image will occupy is there so that we don't see like, a, uh, some, like jumping in the user interface. So that's something that can happen, uh, you might have seen on some websites, that as images come in, the, the content will jump down because they've not specified image widths and heights. So simply deferring loading of assets isn't a new thing, and it isn't really a revolution. But, the, but what is less common is deferring the loading of our content. And this way we start seeing some big performance gains. So the content is the heart of our site. And we, we, we stressed that earlier, that content is king. But, it's not, but not all content is created equal. So where it's appropriate, we can start deferring the loading of content and even choose to not load content that isn't necessary. 
So th this, we can do this in the context of the of, of device the user is using. So let's have a look at an example of how the Metro tried deferred loading of their content. So on small devices, the, the page is a single column, and as you, as you scroll down past the main content, what you'll see is an infinite list of, of related content. So they bring in articles that you might be interested in, polls, um, content from other sites. So it's, so it's, it's trying to get you to, to, to continue your onward journey. But on larger devices, um, you'll see that they actually add a sidebar, uh, which runs alongside of the main content. And because this is, additional content is not needed for smaller devices, it does not appear when the page initially renders. Instead, the content is deferred. The deferred content in this case mu is must-read articles which they think you might find interesting. And by deferring the content, that con uh, we, do, we, do, we don't ha have any performance hit on our mobile device for this additional content. And it, and, it, and, it, and it prevents the browser from loading content in the case where it, it will never be shown to the user. So an another, another example, which is a lot more extreme, is how, is how Facebook load, load their content. So fa Facebook to defer to choose, uh, to choose to defer the, the loading of the majority of the content on our page. This enables them to render the important components first. So this, this, if, you, if you look at the posting panel, for example, what you'll see is you can start interacting with that almost immediately. And in, in doing that, it means that as soon as you, you get to Facebook, you can, start, you can start making a post. So that they are a platform that wants you to make content for them. So they've given that priority to you. There's, there's all, uh, other areas of the site you'll see that, are, that render quickly are like links to your profile and to your notifications and your messages. So this is all really important to them as this, this, this promotes engagement. Um, the, 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 the reason I make the... Facebook site is not a responsive site, but this is a good example of how we can choose to defer loading of content so that we can provide interactivity faster. The same technique could be used on a responsive site. So the biggest danger of deferring content is that if JavaScript fails to load, the content that is deferred will not be loaded. So uh, an, exa an example of this will be the Talk Talk business site, in, in that they, they, they've used AngularJS to load their content. And, and because, I mean, in doing so, they, they, their content actually ha the page has no content if the JavaScript fails to load. So there's lots of situations where JavaScript might fail to load. So perhaps you're on a train, you start loading a page, and you go into a tunnel. You, 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 can't, you can't control that, but, you, but, but the page will fail to load completely. So if, 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 your, if your content is coming through in through JavaScript, the, um, that content will never load. A, a, another example is you walk into a tube station, um, you, you're just browsing a site. Again, if, the, if, if JavaScript fails to load, content is, is then lost. So in that case, we should therefore be careful what content we're choosing to defer loading. So typically, you want to, to never, never um, defer the loading of the main content, but instead defer augmentary content that just enhances your user experience, but what doesn't damage the user experience if it's missing. As we saw earlier, the average size of JavaScript we are including the page has increased from 180 kilobytes to 299 kilobytes in, in the past few years. And it also counts the second largest file size after images before it makes sense so, so, so it therefore makes sense. We try to optimize how we load our JavaScript. So we can, step, we can start separating our JavaScript in two distinct types. These, these are critical JavaScript and our main JavaScript. Critical JavaScript is the JavaScript required to initialize our page. The aim, uh, the aim with our critical JavaScript is to give the users the perception that, our, our, we start, that they can start interacting with the page as soon as possible. This is back to the aim of improving the perceived performance of our site. As a first priority, we, we add events which track how the users try to interact with the page. And in doing so, we, we, we can later handle these events later. We then show states. So, so if a user clicks on one of those buttons that we've added interactive to, to, we can show a state that lets the user know what something is happening while we still wait for the main JavaScript to load. We, and, and, and then finally, once the, once the rest of the page is loaded, our critical JavaScript will, will trigger the main JavaScript to be, to be downloaded. So what is our main JavaScript? This is the JavaScript that carries the main functionality of our site. It might include your services that's, that post off, make, make posts to your server. It might include uh, your carousel that, that and, and your animations. So this is the bulk of your JavaScript. So earlier in our critical JavaScript, we, we said we want our, um, we, 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 we're tracking where people have actually clicked. So in our main JavaScript, we can then handle those clicks. So we can say, the user clicked on this button while we're waiting for our main JavaScript to load, so let's fire the event. It'll also re 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 replace all those deferred event listeners with the real ones, so, so the, the interactive is immediate rather than having to wait. And then it'll include, it, so yeah, it includes the rest of the functionality required for the site to function. So let's have a look at how this works in practice. So on, on, the, on this video, you'll see I've clicked the button, and then in the background, the main JavaScript is loading, and then that validation message appears. So that validation is being done client-side, 
but that's part of our, that's part of our main JavaScript rather than part of our um, critical JavaScript. So, th so that's why we showed a message while we waited for that to be the um, thing. So we, 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 we've, we've so the user has had a page appear very quickly, and it feels like they can interact with it, even though as a developers we know that the interaction is not is actually being faked. Now, if we look at posting message, so uh, the user started interacting with the page. I've, I've um, I'm, write, I'm writing a comment, and then because because the, because in that time the main JavaScript is loaded, the interaction is immediate. So that so because I've got my main JavaScript, I don't have to worry about um, showing any state at all. So how do I measure these uh, measure performance improvements? So by, by when, you, when when you're making changes to your site, you need to be able to, to measure measure changes in, to the performance of your site because you need to know if you're making negative or positive impact to your site. The simplest tool for this is web page test. So the simplest way to use this is enter the URL of your site, test, uh, select test location, and click start. But also there's some advanced options in there that allow you to allow you to choose things like um, is, is it being what the type of connection is loaded. So I can, you can do a test that says oh, that tests how long your site will load over 3G. Um, you can also is, is a browser. Uh, it, it has options for um, actual devices, so you can test how long it takes to load on 3G on a iPhone 4 in Dallas, um, which, which is great. So you, you can you can you can see it measures that, that, that performance. So well, you click start, and, the, 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 and after waiting for the test to run, uh, the, the, the tool will give you a, a benchmark. So it, it'll get those um, colorful squares in the corner are about how, how well you're caching your content on your, or your user device, how, how where you, the, the time it takes to, to do the first byte, whether you're using a CDN, um, whether you're compressing the data that you send to your user. But what's more interesting is, is the things that are below. So earlier when we were talking about perceived performance, we were saying about how the, the, the uh, time it takes to start rendering your site is really important. And here we've got, the th the, in the top table, you see that we've got the time it takes to start rendering your site, not only on the first view, but also on the, on the repeat view, which, which as you can see from my blog, it, it actually takes, it takes more time to load the second time than it does the first time. So I've clearly got an issue there. Um, and then if, if we look at um, the second table, you'll see that it, this is how long it takes to till the page is fully loaded. So this is um, like when it's loaded your images, made all the requests, et cetera. So we, what, what we've seen is the benefits for both the, the user and your business to optimize the performance of your site. It is therefore make, make sense to focus some of your efforts on making your site perform well. So in, in summary, when building a responsive site, we, we should spend time focusing on the content and performance. But both these are critical to our user experience and, 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 and our process should reflect that and they should give, be given time specifically to look at them. Our, our, our content should be prioritized and discoverable. So we want, we want our, our user, regardless on the, on, on the type of device they're using, to have an experience that feels personal to the experience that, to, to what they're trying to achieve. <laughs> and the perception of our site to our user should be, should be that it loads fast. So we want to, we, once we optimize our content, we want it to, to appear on our, on our user's displays as fast as possible. So I, I, have covered a lot, I know I've covered a lot in this talk. So I've, what I've done is I've put um, four examples of everything and some notes on my blog. Um, just on, at uh, jonathandin.com slash forward 2015. Um, I harassed a lot of people to, to uh, see this talk before, before this, so um, thanks goes out to them. Um, and any questions? Yeah.